Successful people learn how to make their mind work for them. I'm David Nagel, and this is the Successful Mind Podcast. Um, here's a, a, a quote from Matthew 7, 7. It says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Man is never satisfied. This fact is deplored by many. But God did not intend man sh- that man should be forever satisfied. The law of his being is perpetual increase progress, and growth. So when one good is realized, another desire for greater good will develop. And when a higher state is reached, another and more glorious state will unfold, his vision and urge him on and on and on. Hence, the advancing life is the true life, the life that God intended man to live. The law of good is universal, for we are not all seeking good in some form or another. Science and logic alike declare that the universe is filled with the essential substance of every imaginable good that man can image, and that he is entitled to the full and ever-increasing supply of any and every good that he may need or desire. We believe, therefore, that it is right and good for a man to seek to gratify all pure desires and ambitions. Here is the key to the law as Jesus gave it. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Every person consciously or unconsciously is operating this law in one or more of its phases. It works universally on every plane of life's expression. We are all daily drawing into our lives the things we desire and expect. And whether we attract good things or bad things, the principle operated is the same. But as we want more of the good things in life and less of the bad, it will be necessary to understand the law more perfectly and so be able to adapt our thinking to it in a more direct fashion. Thus, we secure the greater benefits that secure from the conscious intelligence use of its power. We affirm repeatedly that God is our supply, and if we would think for a moment and trace our supply back to its source, we would agree that the statement is true. The difficulty with some is that they can more easily look to, um, uh, to creature for the source of their substance than creator. We don't really believe that God is some of our substance. We try to think it true and may theoretically accept it, and yet there is some uncertainty. It is hard for some to believe in something that they do not see. It is so much easier to believe in what we see. Now, If we can see plenty all around us, we're willing to believe and enjoy it. But later, as we're able to believe in the abundance of good, we shall then see and enjoy it. Thus, at our outest, the question is, which comes first, seeing or believing? As we study the facts, we shall learn that the latter comes first. And the law is founded on our belief, which in turn determines our sight. People at one time believed in magic. Once they thought material things could appear right out of the air, nothing from nowhere. They also believed that things could be made to disappear into nothing. Science has long since refuted this idea and proven such magic to be impossible, except when it is done through some trick in chemistry or sleight of hand or optical illusion. Nothing can ever become something, nor can something ever become nothing. Substance can be converted, transmuted, and changed in a million ways, but it can never be destroyed. For example, 
If we plant an acorn in the soil, it will sprout forth a tree. Each year, the tree will bring forth leaves in the spring and shed them in the fall. The leaves drop to earth and become a part of the fertile soil. The tree lives for a hundred years, dies, falls to earth, and decays. This decomposed timber slowly becomes part of the earth and is hardened into peat and coal. The coal is mined and brought into the home as fuel. Here it is consumed with fire and burned into ashes, and the heat units thrown off are used to warm the home. The ashes are again cast upon the earth, supplying food to the soil, which finally nurtures another seed and causes it to sprout forth and become, in time, another great tree. Following the cycle of, of substance of the tree, we find it changing form many times. We see it giving off gases, heat units, chemicals of many kinds. And yet, if it were possible to be measured accurately, we would find that not one tiny part has been lost. All the supply there ever was still is and ever shall be, for nothing can ever be wasted or lost. There can never be a shortage in supply because some people do not see an abundance around them and do not enjoy plenty is evidence that they do not understand and do not apply this law. In their blindness, they say that plenty does not exist, and so far as they can see, they may be right. But when they learn to see with their mind's eye, they will realize differently. There's a phase of the law known as demand and supply, which is found in every department of life. Years ago, Thomas Edison resorted to its use when he invented the first electric light. When his carbon lamp was brought to the people as a new kind of lighting far superior to any method then known, did they readily accept it? Many thought it ridiculous and too expensive. They were using candles, oil lamps, and small percentage of gas lamps. Such light was plenty good enough. Hence, quite some time elapsed before the public was educated into the, the advantages of electricity over the old ways of light, heat, and power. Not until the people were convinced of the advantage of this new power did they invest in the future, build powerhouses, set up poles, and string wires all over town to factories and homes. How was all of this accomplished? When there was a demand for the need of electric power, the supply was forthcoming. Where did it all come from? Out of the earth, out of the air, from the water, power, steam, gas, oil, and a thousand other sources. It comes directly from nature, whose foresight created these materials in the earth. Once our forefathers were in style when they rode the stage, a hack, or a carriage, it has not been so long since one was the talk of the town if he owned a fast team of horses and a rubber-tired Victoria or gig. Where are they now? Gone and almost forgotten. The automobile has supplanted them. How did all of this happen? When people demanded a means of traveling with more speed, greater comfort and luxury, necessity gave man an idea. He thought of building a horseless carriage. He worked, uh, he worked on a plan, slowly developed it, and slowly educated the public to accept the modern mode of transportation. One outstanding man dreamed of the world rolling on wheels and set out to build a car that the poor man could afford. Today, the automobile has become such an important factor in man's life that we wonder how we could have ever progressed without it. You see, whenever a man has a need for a certain thing in life, an idea has been first given him in mind. He was inspired to develop the idea, and then it materialized by converting a piece of mud or metal into a usable form. Why did people live so long content with the horse and carriage and not enjoy the automobile? Because they could not imagine it. Their minds were not trained to demand such a thing. Was the supply available to build such a machine? 
there was much supply at hand then as now. In fact, the supply has always been there since the beginning. Thus, it was not God's fault that the auto was so late coming to man's need. It was man's fault because he had been so long, real, so long in realizing the need. Where there is no demand, there will be no evidence of supply. Our parents, who had a horse and a buggy consciousness, could not attract new modes of travel until they were able to enlarge their minds to conceive the necessity of the automobile. The secret of the law lies in, one, in one's consciousness. A man's life consists not in abundance of things he possesses, but in the consciousness of what he has. Man possesses the whole world and all its wealth, yet is only able to enjoy what his consciousness permits him to discern. Somewhere I read a story of a man who lived outside of Pittsburgh and operated a small farm and a dairy. Day in, day out, he worked uh, laboriously to earn a meager living for himself and his family. One day, several men who had been surveying some adjacent land walked across his pasture land. When they were crossing the stream of water that ran through the field, the farmer noticed them stopping stooping down and studying the slime and the scum that had collected against the, the crude footbridge that he had laid there. One man had scooped up some of the water in his hand and apparently drank it. Another collected some water in a canteen he carried and attached to a buckle on his belt. The farmer was puzzled and wondered why anyone should be interested in that stuff. Even the cattle had no taste for it for they pushed the scum aside to drink the clear water. Some weeks later, a man called and offered him a fabulous price for the farm. Why, the man must be crazy, he thought. He could never get his investment back by farming that ground. He had not tried it for years. He was joyful at the prospects of getting such value and readily sold the farm. He moved to Canada to be near his brother and bought another farm. It wasn't long, however, until some weird contraptions were set up on the field that the word spread like wildfire that they had found oil. In a few years, that farm of less than 100 acres produced millions of dollars of oil for its owners. The farmer remained poor and worked hard because he knew only how to scratch the surface and till the soil. Nature had supplied an abundance for the man but he could only realize a scanty portion. He could only see the farm and only the acres of stone and dirt. The law is not at fault because the man was poor and had to work so hard to earn a living. Man will ever be poor as long as he demands of life a meager living and sees it as a struggle, a toil, a hardship, and a limitation. The thing we dare not do is fret and worry about supply or about where the next dollar is coming from. Fretting and worry tend to restrict and limit the supply in hand. They tend to close off the outflow of substance, whether that flow is small or large. Instead of lifting us out of limitation, instead of improving our conditions or increasing our supply, they drag us deeper into the throes of doubt and fear. Instead of expecting more to follow, we grow tense and anxious, which increase our fear and brings us less and less. Instead of tightening up our thinking, we must relax and be more expanding. We must educate our minds to a large state of thinking. When we can think and realize more abundance, we shall receive more abundantly. This does not mean that the engineer is destined to be rich while the farmer remains poor. There are poor engineers and rich farmers. It is not the vocation that determines riches, but the demands that we make of our vocation that determines riches. As we are able to think and to realize more abundance out of what we already have, we shall not only expand our thinking, but receive more abundantly. This is the basic principle of the law. The magnet was not charged of itself, 
but had to be charged with electric energy by one who understood the operation. A magnet in the hands of an untrained man would be uh, little changed, but in the care of a trained engineer, it could become a strong force of attraction and do great good. Likewise, the mind magnet of a person can be stimulated to a strong force of attraction if it is possible to get help from one who already has a full understanding of the law and can give him a good start. Of course, the mind magnet can be charged with some constructive thoughts, but it will take some time for these to be effective as the student who lacks perseverance may too readily become discouraged before the work is accomplished. I always advocate that it is better to get a good start when possible by getting help rather than to come over the slower and more arduous path of self-education. Then the student, knowing that the law does work, will be able to make rapid progress in his development and practice. All the poverty in the world arises from a poverty consciousness, whether it be collective or individual. Why do millions suffer lack and millions more die yearly in India from starvation? I am told that many of them have never in a whole lifetime enjoyed a full meal. Surely it is not because nature has underestimated the need for such a great people. Surely it is not because there is not enough food to go around. It is because of the vision um, of the people has been limited to such a great degree of poverty. Ask the farmer about his crops. He will tell you his problem is not scarcity, but oversupply. Ask the miner. <clears throat> no matter whether he mines for gold, silver, diamonds, coal, or iron, he will tell you that the supply is far greater than that of the demand. Ask the scientist, and he will tell you there is food aplenty. There is more food in the air yet undiscovered than we can use. There is more power in a single drop of water and a lump of sugar than a man can realize in a moment. The supply is greater than the demand, and the demand is determined by man's own thinking. The proposition with most of us is that our power of attraction is too weak to meet the demand. Our mind is like a magnet which draws unto itself its own like, type, and kind. A magnet can draw to itself in proportion to its power of magnetism that is generated or collected within itself. Our mental magnet is greatly reduced in strength by our worries and fears, and our inflow of good is slowly closed off. If our mental force becomes too weakened, we may even repel what little good that is trying to reach us. As we can charge a magnet with electricity and build up its power of magnetism, so can the mind be charged with mental energy that builds up a power of attraction. Like nature, we must follow, follow the natural law. Nature never builds downhill, always up. To receive prosperity, like nature, cannot perform magic miracles. We cannot make health or happiness or dollars out of nothing. Nature shows us how we can convert much or little of the available substance into usable material. The available substance is our thought, and we charge our minds with constructive thoughts. Like nature, to accomplish good, our thoughts, thoughts must always be building upward. They must be constructive. If, for example, a drone bee in a hive has decided to lay down on its brothers and only do half a job, does Mother Nature agree to find it part-time work for the special bee? She does not. She impresses the other bees who are working hard to collect the honey and fill the hive to send their soldiers after the drone. It is politely marched outside and stung to death. Nature destroys the lazy bee. If thoughts enter our minds that are not full of strength, are not wholly positive like nature, we must comply with the law and destroy them. We dare not to entertain a half-truth or a lazy thought. 
without weakening the power of attraction and reception. Right here is an excellent place for us to begin with an inventory. We should sieve our thoughts carefully uh, to separate the strong thoughts from the drone thoughts. The drones must be cast out and destroyed by refusal to accept them any longer. Then we must carefully guard every thought so that another weak one cannot unconsciously or consciously slip through and play destruction with the others that are trying to do good. A man came to me one day in the fall and expressed his fears pertaining to his job. He had been employed for many years in a hotel that for the first time had felt like the effects of a dull season. It was rumored, he said, that the management was going to close down the house and let out the employees until spring. He said, I feel these folks know that there will be a shutdown. They are in the office of the manager. What do you think that I can do about it? There is only one thing you can do, I answered. Go back to your work and realize the law. If the law determines your supply and position, then no one but the law can change it for you. If you will realize this and keep it constantly in mind, I shall help you keep the law at work. If the law has another position for you, there will be a door open before this one can close. Go back to your work and ignore the rumors. Let the others fear and fret but don't let yourself come under their thought. To prove your faith or confidence in the law, prepare to enter another year's business on your own books. Get ready to carry on and expect your work to increase and improve. He went back and did as he was told. When the rumors grew to realities, he held firmly to the thoughts of increased work and business. Thus, he was... Uh, retrained during the slack times. He was kept in the office to handle the business. And because of the increased work and responsibility placed upon him, he was given an increase in salary. If he had been allowed to entertain the fears and thoughts of loss and lack, he would have suffered with the rest that were laid off. This is according to the law, and the law is no respecter of persons. If he had allowed his thoughts for good to become adulterated with thoughts of lack, he would have weakened his mental magnet. He could not have attracted any more than his mind was able to receive. In matters, not how much we pray or how loud we pray, our praise can only be be answered as we work the law. The law will serve us in proportion to how well we serve it. Robert Collier, in one of his books, tells of an incident that happened in Chicago. A young man, while in an elevator of a large business house, was asked the question, what is your religion? He promptly answered to the surprise of others that his religion was Sears and Roebuck Company. The young man is one of the executives of the same company today. Why? He touched the law of supply Uh, in that he thought solely in terms of his interests. His firm's success was his success. His, His concerted interests enabled him to become part of the firm. Today, he has tufted seat, a handsome office, and a fine salary. If your need is supply, then your religion is the same. Like the young man, uh, your single thought must be abundance. As abundance and supply are one, then use the law that you must think supply, talk supply, and live supply with every thought. Keep your thoughts so occupied with this idea of plenty that any and all drone thoughts of lack or loss will be destroyed. Remember, do not confuse money with supply. Money is but one of the numerous means of supply. Money is not the root of evil, but the love of money is. If you concentrate upon money alone and use every means to gather it and hoard it, you are forcing the law to close out other good. If you concentrate on a part and not the whole, you get only a small part. 
If you concentrate on the whole, you'll enjoy all its parts. If you love money, use the law solely to amass riches. You may gain riches, but you will also lose so much more than it is good that your life will be quite empty and lonely. I knew a man who determined early, early in, in his life to concentrate on accumulating money. He attained his ambition and became an influential power in his town. He confided in a friend before he died, saying, I did everything I knew to become rich. I gained riches, but I lost the love and the companionship of my wife and the joy of being a father to our children. I lost my health, and I am spending my wealth to, reign, uh, to regain my health. But somehow, it doesn't respond. Yes, I learned how to, how to get rich, but I never learned how to live. If we love the law, use the law to gain supply, and use it wisely, we will satisfy every desire. We will learn how to live wholesomely, freely, and wisely, and there will be no losses. Our lives will be, a com will be as complete as God. The law des designed them to be. There may be many of you who are trying to follow the truth ideas who have earnestly affirmed and thought statements for supply, but somehow it has only come in small amounts or not at all. This may be largely due to the fact <clears throat> that your senses are yet too strong for your mind to control. You must see first before you can believe. That is, you are so used to seeing, you, seeing just so much supply or money that in spite of your statements, you believe more in what you see than what you're trying to think. To you, it is necessary to first train your senses to come under the control of your thoughts, which you know must think to conform with the law. Florence Shin gives us a clear example in this in her book, The Game of Life. She tells of a man who was seeking a new position and having a limited amount of money was debating in his mind whether to buy a new coat or hold tight to the money in case he was long in getting employment. He was advised to buy the coat and it was an expensive fur coat. This reduced his bank account considerably, but increased his confidence and stimulated his faith to such a degree that his prospective employer caught the spirit of it and gave him a splendid job. The coat served to enable him to feel prosperous, and the, <clears throat> the venture strengthened his courage and confidence. So the law proceeded to satisfy the demand. If such a condition arises wherein one feels better for seeing some evidence of prosperity, then it is wise to do which makes it easier for the person to draw prosperity to him. Certainly, it is not helpful to work for prosperity and to see a stack of bills before you or a condition of limitation and squalor around you. It is better to come away with such a sight and go where the view is more in keeping with the desire of the mind. When I desire to work for prosperity for myself or others, I try to stay in an environment where there is plenty of beauty and where the people around me are not in limited straits. It follows, therefore, that you can steadily draw into your life any and every form of good that you may truly desire as it is the will of God that you should enjoy every good that will promote happiness and progress. <clears throat> All desires are an expression of the will, while to expect good is to, man good is to demand good so that both are necessary <clears throat> to attract supply. Therefore, seek to adjust your desire with God's plan and, and the law and expect that every good and only good can reach you, then nothing but good can come. An abundance of all needed good is the natural heritage of every man, woman, and child. That is the vital truth. It is wrong for one to dwell in poverty when there is plenty for all. It is wrong for one member of the human family to accumulate vast wealth at an expense of his fellow man. Wrong for one to dwell in conditions of war and chaos 
when peace may prevail. Wrong for the strong to take advantage of the weak. Wrong <clears throat> to lack in good of any kind that may be essential to promote the welfare and the happiness of the individual. So whatever falls short of giving satisfaction, harmony, growth, and increase is abnormal. Nature originally attended that the real needs of man should be adequately supplied, not his surface wants, which are often impulses, but not the normal specific needs of the individual, which would be abundantly satisfied were man to live in closer harmony with the fundamental law of supply. Thanks for listening to the Successful Mind Podcast. And if you like what you heard and you want to know more, go to davidnagel.com forward slash free stuff.